Thanks, Nate. I uh, really appreciate the introduction and the prayer. Uh, my name is Jim Hall. Uh, obviously, I attend church here. I'm one of the deacons here. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the verse that was just read. But first, I'm going to tell you about uh, something that happened to me, oh, 35 years ago or so. And my wife and I went to Crystal Cave in California. And uh, it's a big cave, and they have guided tours. We went down into guided tours, went in through the different areas and everything. They showed us uh, different caves, stalactites, stalagmites, crystal formations, a lot of different things. And at one point, they took us into a, a pretty big cavern, not quite as big as this auditorium, but, but not small by any way, shape, or form. And they took us in there, and he talked about caves and various rock formations and things. And then... Uh, he told us that he's going to do something. He's going to turn out the lights. Now, you know, when at nighttime you look, and it's not totally dark usually, right? You know, you can see a little bit. There's starlight or something, you know, maybe moonlight, whatever. Well, in here he turned out the lights. It was black. You couldn't see a thing. Couldn't see my hand in front of my face. Uh, in effect, I was blind. And I didn't have my hand on a light switch. Uh, I will tell you that Dana grabbed my hand fairly tightly uh, until she didn't like it much either. But, but I mean, I wasn't afraid, but uh, what I noticed was this is what it must be like to be blind. Really, you have no control. You can't see. There's no light. And after talking for a few minutes about caves and various things, he lit a match just a match. Now picture in here something a little bit smaller than what we have in this auditorium. He lit this one match. Now if I were to ask you how much light does a match give? You think, well, I don't know. It's something like this, you know, a little bit of light around here. Can I tell you that we could see to the ceiling in that cavern by the light of a single match? Our eyes had adjusted to the darkness and we could see it. Now, if you haven't gathered it by yet, by the verse we read, I'm going to be talking a little bit about light today, okay? The light of the world. But before I talk about light, I want to talk about blindness. Because blindness is the thing that uh, we can have in this world. I just demonstrated physical blindness, talking about what I mentioned to you. I didn't demonstrate so you could see it. wish I could. wish we could have closed everything down, made it all dark, sit for a few minutes, let your eyes adjust. We don't have time for that. So you got to imagine it. you got to trust what I'm saying. I speak the truth in this. I was there. It was very dark. Couldn't see a thing. Now, without light, we were blind. That was physical blindness. But I want to talk to you with something even worse, spiritual blindness. Spiritual blindness was in the world at that time. If you talk, the Pharisees were listening to Jesus, they were spiritually blind. And here's the big difference. If I'm physically blind, somebody can tell me how to be saved, and I can come into the light, I can find a way into heaven through Jesus. If you are spiritually blind, it doesn't matter. You are not going to get there. We can't get there of our own accord. It just can't happen. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. Darkness is the opposite of light. Now, darkness can't ex extinguish the light, but the light can extinguish the darkness. And that's something to remember. That's something to see because it's very important. We live in a fallen, dark world. And when I say that, I'm going back to what we call the original sin. The original sin was when Adam and Eve were put on this earth, and they were put in the Garden of Eden. And in the Garden of Eden, everything was perfect. Do you ever think about that? Do we ever hear, we hear the people talk about utopia, all right? They talk about utopia. There's been movies on it. What's utopia? Well, that's our human version of how the world would be perfect. And can I tell you that our human version never works? We can't make utopia. But when they put Adam and Eve, when God put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, it was perfect. You wanted something to eat? You walked out and picked it off a tree. It was all there in the garden, ready for the picking. The animals? Don't believe there's any carnivores. Think the animals got along, and I think that they were friendly with people. I have a daughter that really likes all kinds of animals. I can relate. I have raised many types of animals. Uh, just a few. Crows, raccoons, 
taking care of wounded snakes, baby birds, sparrows, a variety of things. And my daughter was the same way. If there was some critter that needed to be taken care of, she took care of it. Well, in the Garden of Eden, it was kind of like that where the animals were friendly. They talk about Adam went out and named all the animals. Do you ever think about that? How about if I looked at you and I, I looked and I said, well, Nate, I want you to go out here. You know, there's a few animals in the world, in case you haven't noticed. I want you to name them all. Now, Adam it didn't it give us any occasion. He complained. He went and did it. But that's really not the point. The point is the world was perfect until. The world was perfect until someone sinned. In this perfect world, God said one thing, gave him one law. Now, those of you that got kids, do you ever go out and leave your kids and maybe one of them's old enough to be the babysitter or maybe even get a babysitter and you tell them what they shouldn't touch, right? Okay, you guys can eat this. Don't get into the candy. Now, anybody here ever have kids come and get into the candy? In my house, what happens is I find a stash of wrappers somewhere, okay? And then it's, it's like, okay, somebody's been eating candy. Could somebody fess up to this? Sometimes it's easy, you know? Somebody's like, I did it. Sometimes I got to look at faces. I look at their faces, and I can tell who did it, right? Did you do it? Mm-mm. Point being on all of that, God gave them one command. Do not eat of the fruit of this tree. You can eat any fruit in this whole beautiful garden. You can take anything. You can eat it. Don't eat from this tree. And then we know the story. Okay, the serpent talked to Eve, talked her into eating the fruit of the tree. It was the first sin, what we call the original sin. Now, my story is not about all of that. But I want you to understand that it was a perfect world, and then sin was introduced. The first thing, sin was introduced and the world became not perfect. Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. What, where they used to be able to walk into a garden and fruit was hanging on a tree, all of a sudden they had to work for it. Now we're very, most of us are pretty familiar with having a garden. Do you ever have a garden and you work hard in it? And it's hard work, picking weeds, doing things. And then sometimes it works and still sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't work right. That's our world. Things don't work right. We live in a fallen world. I want to talk about what our world's like. If you look in the paper or on the internet or on TV, murder and violence is pretty common in our country, in our world. If we were to look in our country, how many days go by where we don't read about a murder? It's not that I check it, but I know that murder's there every day demonstrates our sin nature that without a love of God, we are a base, corrupt people. And that's hard for a lot of us to take. But that was what Jesus was talking to the Pharisees about. And we're going to get into that and dig into that a little bit deeper. Every person sitting in this room has sinned. Now, you don't have to take that as my word. That's the Bible. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So I just want you to understand where we're at. You've got to see where we're at. You've got to understand where we're at. We've all sinned. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later too. So we've determined that we are in a sinful world, and it's a dark world because of sin. And, you know, praise God. God did not intend us to stay in darkness forever. He provided a way for us to come into the light. His plan from the beginning was to send his son, Jesus, to the world to be born as a baby, to live as a person. But the difference was he lived as a person without sin. Now, I just told you, all of you guys in this room have sinned. I hope nobody wants to dispute me on that because I'll hold up the Bible as my backup. I got a backup plan. But the point of this was Jesus never sinned. And that made him different, notwithstanding he's God. Because that he was born and lived without sin, he was able to pay a sacrifice for sin. Before Jesus came, the world sacrificed animals. Now, sacrificing animals for sin was like a Band-Aid on the problem. It didn't last. It couldn't last. They tried to pick perfect animals, 
and sacrifice them, but the animal could never pay the price that God demanded for sin. And so we have this price that had to be paid. We're putting a Band-Aid on it, okay? Anybody here ever get a leak in their basement wall? And, you know, they advertise paint. You can paint on your basement wall that'll stop water from coming in. I don't know. Some people have had luck with it. I personally haven't. It's like putting a Band-Aid on a problem that's just going to come back. It's going to keep leaking in, leaking in until you do something to fix it. And to fix it, you kind of got to go outside to fix it. You usually got to dig up the outside, do something all there, patch things. I don't know. I'm not a carpenter. I've just seen them do it. Well, God looked and said they're putting a Band-Aid on sin, trying to pay for it, and they can't pay for it. And this was the plan from the beginning. God knew when he created this world, when he put people on it, that they were going to sin. And he had the plan in place before it even happened. Isn't that a wonderful thing? God's got a plan. So Jesus came, lived, and was sacrificed, and he paid the sin debt for an entire world. In our study of the Gospel of John, we have seen that Jesus comes in order to make some changes. He wants to make changes because the world's not working to handle sin properly. And he came to take care of that. Now, if you look, there's extraordinary examples of healing, of grace. He performed many miracles. Uh, There was healing, changing uh, changing people from blind into seeing, water into wine, feeding thousands with a few loaves of bread and some fish. This demonstrated God's love for us as well as Jesus' divinity. Unfortunately, religious leaders failed to see it that way. Now you wonder, you asked like if you saw Jesus and you heard him preaching, obviously he could preach and he affected people in a tremendous way. Do you ever think if you could hear him in person talking, how would you react? I'd like to think that it would make a difference in my life. I've seen some pretty awesome preachers. We had some pretty awesome pre- preaching in this church sometimes. You know, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I, but I've seen some of the, well, Billy Graham was a tremendous evangelist. I saw people coming up by the drove sometimes when he had an altar call. But the point of all that is Jesus was the been the best. And yet, he's talking to the Pharisees and they can't see it. Why? A little bit more on that later. Put that in your back pocket. We'll come back there. Um, they were concerned about their comfortable lifestyle. They didn't want to upset Rome. When you start talking about the Messiah, the king. So in this, they seem confused, and Jesus declares emphatically who he is. He's the Christ, the Messiah, the light of the world. The Pharisees were looking for an opportunity to have him killed. Why? He was performing miracles. People were praising him, and they didn't like it. It was taking away from their glory. And so they're already planning, plotting how to have him killed. They're just trying to find a way because they got to do it within their own little laws. And despite several tries, the Bible tells us they weren't allowed by God to harm him until it was time. So where's this all taking us? Well, first, this is taking us right now in the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus came down from the Mount of Olives. It's about three kilometers from Jerusalem. And he came down in there and he's preaching in the temple. That's where this whole story takes place. Uh, In it, Jesus claims to be the light of the world. John 8, 12. Okay. Um, Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of the world. Main point of all these verses that I'm doing, Jesus is the light of the world. Don't forget that. That's the main point. This is what we're looking at. In my house, I have a saying, and I kind of originate it, and it's not like I'm pointing to myself saying, oh, what a wonderful saying, but it emphasized what I wanted to teach my children. And I've always said, keep the main thing the main thing. And that main thing is your relationship with God, your relationship with Jesus. If you don't keep the main thing the main thing, nothing's going to work right. You get that? Your relationship with God is what makes everything work all together. When they refer to Jesus, they talk to him as the cornerstone. When they looked at the cornerstone, cornerstone was like the main stone in a building. Without it, the building would fall down. 
And I looked at that in my own family. I said, I want my kids to keep the main thing the main thing. And I've always said that to them. Well, here we're looking at that Jesus is the light of the world. That's the main point of this story. And an absence of light, I talked about it, already leaves us blind. So we understand that without Jesus, we're blind. Revelation 21, 23 talks about the new Jerusalem. And in that, I, I want you to tell you how important the light is. So I want to read this to you this just quickly. It says, the city had no need of the sun or moon. Now, this is a, a big cube of city. It's big. And it says, did not need the light of the sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Jesus Christ. So understand, think about that for a minute. How many days you get up and it's a cloudy, rainy day? I'm sorry, you live in Binghamton. A lot. <laughs> and we look in here and it's a cloudy, rainy day, but how about when it's a bright, sunny day? Which do you like better? And it's not like we don't need rain. I don't mind a rainy day, but... We need the light of the sun. We look at the light of the sun, and it sure is nice to walk outside, especially after a long winter, and uh, have a nice sunny day and go outside. Light is good. And yet, in this new city, this new Jerusalem, the light of God's always going to be in it, and the lamp is Jesus. So the main idea of our passage is Jesus is the light of the world. So what's this mean? Well, let's take a look at this. I'm going to unpack it together in three points. First point is Jesus has come to bring freedom. Well, what does freedom mean? Let's look in the Bible, okay? John 8, 30 through 36. As he, this is Jesus, was saying these things, many believed in him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham. We have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say we will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain, remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Did you get that? Slave to sin. You commit sin, you become a slave to sin. It's important that we try to stop sinning. Now I understand we're never going to be totally free from sin until we're home. You do know this world's not your home. We look to a home in heaven someday. But in this, we live in a broken, fallen world and it's going to be difficult because sin exists. Now, there's a good thing for us, though. Because Jesus came, we can be forgiven for our sins. Jesus died on a cross, the perfect lamb. He paid the debt for our sins. If you've been in churches here very long, you kind of have heard this before. It's an important thing. And what that gives us is future hope. We can experience true joy. Slavery from sin sucks the joy out of your life. If you ever look at somebody that commits sin regularly, that doesn't know God, you don't look good. I'm just saying, you can see it. Do you ever see a drug addict that had been a drug addict for years? They don't look good. They don't look healthy. The joy has been sucked out of their life. And a lot of times they don't understand why, and it's a horrible thing. Drug addiction is a horrible thing. And, you know, people talk and they often say, young children are perfect. I don't want to burst anybody's bubble, but I don't totally agree with that. You ever see two little kids playing? One has a toy and the other doesn't have it. And one reaches out and grabs the toy and takes it away from the other little kid. And what's the first one do? Smacks him. I didn't teach him that. You didn't have to teach him that. We are naturally drawn to sin. So remembering on this, it's, it's just important to see that, one, sin comes naturally, and it's what the Bible calls our carnal or sin nature. Our desire is to sin. We have to fight or choose not to sin and to follow God. And sin can become an addiction and enslave us. Now, one way to fight this sin every day 
be in your Bible. You should read your Bible every day. Why? What's the Word of God? You ever think about that, how fortunate we are to have the Word of God? And I look, how many people do you know that don't own a Bible? And how many people would have the opportunity to get one? It's fairly few. We're fortunate. There are some people that might not, and it's fortunate we can give them Bibles. We do that in this church. We give people Bibles. Read your Bible every day. As the light, Jesus came to bring freedom. Okay, and that, that kind of concludes our first point, that Jesus came to bring freedom. So why do you need the light? Well, it's tied into the freedom thing. We're not free. Do you get that? We're not free. Jesus came to bring the light. Let me uh, turn to John 8, 39 through 47 and read that. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing what Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It's because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the word of God. The reason you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Now when Jesus says that Satan was a liar from the beginning, well, if you're not aware of it, Jesus tried to overthrow God in heaven. He was the most powerful angel, and he decided... I want this for myself. I want to be king. Um, can I tell you that it's a bad idea to go up against God? God just took the most powerful being besides him and just kicked him out of heaven. Boom, gone. I've seen people get angry at God for a variety of things in their own life. Can I tell you, it never works. Uh, number one, you can't put yourself on a level playing field with God. God's so far above us, it's not even funny. Let me know anybody here that can create planets. And I won't even get into creating an ecosystem that works and creating animals and life and everything there. So you understand that you're not God. Getting angry with God isn't going to serve a purpose. God didn't cause problems in your life. Sin did. Sin in this planet did. And that's not God's fault. little side road. So... Let me continue on here. What does this mean for us? We should come to grips with our true sin nature. We're sinners. We don't naturally love God. You think about it. Who was the very first person born on the planet? I'm not talking Adam and Eve. They were created. Cain. Cain, the very first person born. Now, his brother Abel, they both sacrificed to God. Uh, God did not find Cain's sacrifice acceptable. And God even talked to Cain about it. And, of course, Cain accepted God's reprimand and life went on perfectly, right? No. Cain got up and killed his brother Abel. Do you ever think about this as our heritage, that the very first person born on this planet became a murderer? Please don't look and say that we're basically good people. We're not. We're not basically good people. We've got to fight to try and be good. The worldview says that we're good people, right? How many people you talk to? I've talked to people many times, and they say, well, listen, you know, if I talk to them about heaven, they come back and they say, well, listen, I'm basically good. I'm going to go to heaven. Only really bad people go to hell, right? And they're often shocked when I say, well, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin, this is your payment for sinning, is death. Now that death is not even the physical death. This is a spiritual death, which means you're going to go to hell. That's a somber truth, and it's just the way it is, but that's what the Bible says. And if we believe differently, that's sad because you're misleading yourself. 
And uh, sin addiction is an evidence of our slavery. The world's full of sin addictions. How many times you have a conversation with someone and you're trying to talk to them, right? And they're like, "Mm mm-hmm, yeah, yeah, I'm with you, yeah, sure, Mm mm-hmm. Oh, okay. oh, yeah, 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 right, right. I'm not saying that cell phones are bad. They're not. But I'm saying if they take over your life and you spend your life on a cell phone, that's one type of addiction. And that's not even like a really bad addiction. Uh, pornography, alcohol, drugs, that's just a few that are common today. Galatians 5, 19 through 21 has a list of addictions that will keep you out of heaven. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger. You got problems being angry? The Bible talks about it. Rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. You know it says things like these? That means there's a lot more than that. I warn you as I warned you before that these, those that do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you understand why we need to have a light of the world? This will keep you out of heaven. I don't want you to not be in heaven. So what gives Jesus the authority to make all these claims that he's talking about? That he's the light of the world and and that sin will keep you out of heaven? Well, that brings me to my third point. Jesus is God. Pharisees had a little trouble accepting that. But let me talk to you about what the Bible said. John 8, 51 through 53. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know you have a demon. Abraham died as did the prophets, yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? And the prophets died. Who do you make yourself out to be? So Jesus is going to answer this because they still aren't getting it. They still don't understand that he is the Messiah. They're not seeing it. And it's really funny when you make up your mind to something and you're latched onto it and you say this is the truth, but you really don't have the knowledge to back it up, how hard it is sometimes to change your mind. So John 8, 56 through 59. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, and Jesus hid himself, went out of the temple. The term I am appears over 300 times in the Bible. And uh, typically, when it's put in like that, where it just says, I am, not going on to say something else like, I am dumb. (laughs) That's when it says, I am, it means it's referring to God. I want to tell you one of the first times it was used was in Exodus 3, 13 and 14. And this was when God was telling Moses to go when he wanted him to be the instrument to free the Israelites from slavery. Oh, by the way, you know, the Jews said they'd never been enslaved. I guess they weren't counting when all the Jews were enslaved to Egypt. A little funny in that point. Um, Exodus 3, 13 and 14, Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So understand the Jews, when they heard that, they understood exactly what Jesus is saying when he said, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus was declaring emphatically that he was God, which is why they wanted to stone him. That was blasphemy. And they'd been wanting to kill him anyway because he was tipping over their apple cart. They weren't too happy. And so they were looking for a reason to kill him, and and they quickly jumped on this. But you notice something? A lot of times we worry about when we're going to die, don't we? Uh, I know it was on my mind. I had children later in life, and I was concerned about living long enough to raise them. And, and I used to pray a bit about that. And uh, as I studied the Bible, I realized God tells in, norm, in many places, you're not going to die until it's your time. And this is what happened with Jesus. The Jews were trying to kill him, 
And multiple times they came up and they said they couldn't find him, they couldn't kill him because it was not his time. You understand, God tells us all that when the time, he knows the exact time and date, you're going to die. So why do you worry about it? That was a a point for me. I quit worrying about when I'm going to die. I'm going to die when God says my time's up. And uh, (laughs) I guess on this, uh, it's important that we trust in God. So what's that all mean for us? Well, I'll tell you what it means. If you're not saved, Jesus came because we needed a Savior for our sins. The current religious leaders were not following what God wanted. God wanted to give us a permanent solution for the forgiveness of our sins, not the temporary one of animal sacrifice. This required a change. Now, you know what I know is good. You're in a Baptist church, we're Baptists, we love change, right? (laughs) I don't say that to, to hammer anybody. Not all change is good. But in this case, Jesus was coming to make a change. And I'll I'll mention this in passing. If there's something in our church, if we want more people to come to church than we have coming, we need to make a change. I'm not saying it changed everything or whatever. I'm not even getting into that. All I'm saying is I went to a uh, seminar once, and the guy said, your church is sized perfectly for what you're doing now. And I I took offense to that because we were trying hard to grow. I was like, you don't even know our church. What are you talking about? You don't know what we're doing. Your church is sized perfectly for what you're doing now. What we had done is brought our church to that size, and that's where it was. If you wanted something more, if you wanted church to grow more, you need to make a change. I'm not going down that road any further, but I'm just saying Jesus came to make a change because it wasn't the way he wanted. The, the leaders, the religious leaders resented Jesus so much they plotted to kill him. They had lost their relationship with God and they were not hearing. Now believers, those that have been saved, if Jesus is the light of the world, and we are followers of Jesus, our life ought to reflect that. People should look at you and see something different. They should look at you and say, you know, I, I know that person. They're pretty upbeat and they help you. You ought to be doing something. People could identify the fact that you're saved and there's a difference in your life, that you are showing the light of Jesus. Jesus' light should be mirrored in us. It should be true of every Christian. We should be teaching people, reaching people, and leading them to salvation. Now, some of you might say, I'm not very good at that. It's not my thing. That's not my wheelhouse. Well, the Bible talks about refining silver. Now, most of us, I'm going to guess, don't know a lot about refining silver. And uh, I read a study where they were talking about the verses in the Bible and that, and the author decided that she wanted to find out what it meant by refining silver. Because the Bible talks about that in numerous places. So she went to a silversmith. Makes sense. Asked, how do you work with silver? And he says, well, silver has to be heated to exactly the right temperature. If you heat it too much or too little, it doesn't work. And you either got to throw it out or start over. Well, she said, well, how do you know when you've heated it to the right temperature? And he goes, well, that's easy. When I can see my reflection in it. Do you get that? You think God didn't know what he was talking about when he says we need to be refined like silver? Who's doing the refining? God. Whose image ought to be in the silver? God's image. Who do we look to for our salvation? Jesus. Who should we reflect? Who should our image be if we've been refined enough? Jesus. People should look at us and see Jesus. Now, I want to show you an image here. Uh, I'm going to show you an image of the moon. This image of the moon is what we call the dark moon. It's not all lit up. Now you look at it up there, right? Does that look like it would reflect light? It's dusty dirt. Now if I was making a mirror, I don't think I'd take a plate of dirt and hang it on my wall for a mirror. It's not much of a mirror. However, it's not always 
the reflection. It's the source. What does a full moon look like? Full moon takes the light of the sun and shines it quite well. Do you ever walk outside on a moonlit night where it's clear? And you notice you can see quite well? I mean, it's bright. And you look here, this is what dirt can reflect light like. You get me? What are we made of? What did the Bible say we were made from? Dust. Now, that's the light of the sun. How much more the light of Jesus, who's the light of the world, can you reflect and show that? I want you to remember that Jesus is our king, and he's the greatest person to ever walked the face of this earth in human form. That's the truth. That's, in, a, in a courtroom, they say, these are the facts, and they're indisputable. Well, I would say the fact that Jesus was the greatest person that ever lived is indisputable. And I want you to talk about how great it is, how great a God we have, how great a Savior we have. And before you say, well, you know, I, I get that, but I'm not good at sharing. And say, if you came up on a car accident, and there's a bad car accident, and a car went over a cliff, and somebody's hanging on the cliff by their fingertips. They're hanging there, and they almost went over with the car, and they're hanging by their fingertips, and unless somebody helps them, they're going to die. Are you going to look and say, I'd like to help you, but I'm not really good at that. I'm going to walk away. You wouldn't do that. What about the person that's lost in their sin and is going to hell unless somebody helps them and changes their way? Are you going to walk away from them and say, well, I'm not really good at talking to people about the Bible. Can I suggest if you're not good about talking to people about the Bible, you read your Bible more and get good with it? Because you never know when you're going to see a person there and that's gonna, you might be the only one that has a chance to witness to this person. You might be the only one that can keep this person falling into the abyss of hell. Harsh words? It's just the way it is. And I think that Jesus is our light. He's the bread of life. And I can't describe him the way he deserves to be described. So I'm going to have you watch a video that describes him way better than I do. Enjoy. The Bible says, my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder, do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. 
and it's put him in light. I wish I could describe him, but yet he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! Yeah, that's my king. I wonder, do you know him? Like I said, he could say a lot better than I did. Uh, I'm going to call the worship team back up here. And uh, I'm going to pray in one second. I just wanted to say if anybody is unsure or wanted to talk about their salvation, I'll be sitting down front here during our last songs. Feel free to come down and talk to me or come free. Talk to any of us uh, leaders in the church, uh, Nate, Christian, any of the deacons. We exist, one of the most important things we exist for this church is to lead people to Christ, that and discipleship. Of course, love God comes first. Love God, love people, make disciples. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to a close here, grateful for your word. Know that your word will not go out without bearing fruit. And so we look for you to bear the fruit beyond us, not by our own efforts. We know our own efforts are weak. But we know that you're able to do anything and reach anybody's heart that needs to be reached. And that's what we look for. We look for this message to help people. And not because I did a good job, but because you're a great God. And we just pray, Lord, that as we go forward, let us live our lives in a way that we're not walking in sin. In Jesus' name, amen.